But before we get on to today's panel on climate change, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about something you can do right here in San Miguel to address climate change. There is a project to help the Biblioteca save money by installing LED lights and possibly at a later stage uh, installing you know, solar panels on the roof to power and replace the uh, electric bill. Um, that project has been spearheaded by Ernie Lowry, and let me give you the floor to explain it and, okay. and ask for your donations in support of this project. Well, almost a year ago, in this very room, we started talking about global warming. And whatever reason life occurs and things happen in your head, I looked up at the light bulbs, and I realized these are old-fashioned incandescent light bulbs. And somehow I got inspired with that, and with Bill, Bill Willens and Kathy's help and some other people, we started to accumulate light bulbs. Every time I go back to Denver, I bought light bulbs. I was up to 150 in October, and then we started to install them. And the first report came in last Friday. In one, in one month comparison, they saved 9,000 pesos. We did half the building. The building requires 300 bulbs. We got, we put in 150, we saved 9,000 pesos. As of yesterday, thanks to the Willens Foundation of Kent, Ohio, all the bulbs are going to be purchased the next week. Oh, perfect. They're coming in from Denver at three bucks a piece on sale at Home Depot. As of this morning, this morning, also because of a meeting in this room, I have an offer to replay, put in solar panels, no charge. You just read it. You, I gave you a copy. Savings to the library, a quarter of a million pesos a year. Bill Whitman is here. He's treasurer of the library. He's on the board of directors. And I invite him to join in because we, his organization has to get smarter and so does the Center for Global Justice. Bill needs more people as board of directors on the board of directors because people leave and retire and so forth. So let's put our heads together. That's the best news today. And so if you would like to, uh, to donate to the uh, Biblioteca Solar Project, we'll accept donations today, uh, either cash or if you want to make out a check to the Center for Global Justice. We'll see that it uh, helps advance this project. Uh, if you want to know about other events of the Center for Global Justice, let me pass this sign-up sheet around. And to give me your email address, I know many of you are on the list already. Every weekend, we send out a notice of what's coming up the following week. You can read about it, usually in Atencion. Um, <coughs> Uh, you'll get your own personal invitation to it. The whole discussion of climate change that we're focusing on this week was, of course, inspired by this book, Naomi Klein's This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. How many of you have read the book? Oh, great. We, we had a, uh, you know, last year we had a community read and for Six weeks we had discussions in this room every week um, and turned a lot of people off. <coughs> and yesterday we showed the film that came out of it uh, by Naomi Klein and her husband Avi Lewis. How many of you saw the film? Okay, yeah. so everybody is well, has all the background they need for today's panel. Let me turn it over to Susan Goldman, who will be chairing the panel and introduce. Welcome everyone. Can you hear me? I'll just stay seated if you can hear me. Great. Um, Cliff asked some questions that I was going to ask. 
But I have one more question. How many Canadians are here? Congratulations for ousting Harper. Right. Okay, so I'm privileged to moderate this panel of distinguished speakers who not only are colleagues, but friends. So I know that they spent or they spend big chunks of their lives reading, studying, writing about climate change and related issues like the economy. And I'm really looking forward to their talks. I'm sure we'll learn a lot from them. Um, each panelist will speak 15 to 20 minutes, so we'll have time for a lively discussion, comments, questions afterwards. And the first speaker will be Richard Snyder, Dick Snyder, and he'll be talking on the urgency of now. I'm wearing a button that says the urgency of now, which our other panelist, Georgianne, had made last year in relationship to climate change. And, and I think that Dick's going to address the effects that we're seeing now because of climate change. So, Dick Snyder. Oh, okay. and, the oh, and please don't <laughs> silence your cell phones, Greg, please remind me. That was my wife that clapped. I was going to say, I'm not that. Um, George Ann is the one that made the buttons and really acquainted me with Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, service, a sermon that he gave that included the term, the fierce urgency of now. And that's what gave me the thought. And I really appreciate George Ann for doing that. And I looked and looked and looked for my button, but I gave it away. So I don't have to wear with Susan's button. <laughs> But I'd like to say good morning and I appreciate the fact that we do have some rubber duckies in San Miguel that aren't afraid to come out on a rainy morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You know, it's, a year ago I was a presenter on a panel reviewing uh, Naomi Klein's new book and several members of this panel were part of that too. Uh, for that panel I presented information from part two of her book where she clearly outlined many issues. But the one that shocked me was when she outlined the disastrous merger of what she called Big Green with the corporate world. It delineated how the flow of corporate dollars, often coupled with seats on corporate boards, had perverted the mission of organizations like the Wildlife, the World Wildlife Fund, the Nature Conservancy, the Environmental Defense Fund, and several more. She outlined how these organizations have been in bed with many of the major energy extractive and developmental corporations. I was shocked by this, this merger of interests that did not support the environment and stand against global warming. I've titled this presentation, The Fierce Urgency of Now. I've taken this from a sermon that Dr. King gave April 1967, entitled, Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. It is time that we, in like manner, break our silence about global warming and climate change and the fierce urgency of now that we are facing. I like to say that I'm anything but a scientist. I've always been an organizer, a manager, and an artist. I'm not going to present anything about climate change or about massive changes in where agricultural land of the future might be or of the salt infiltration of our fresh water systems or all the other effects of global warming and climate change. I'm going to focus on human wealth and the migration of Americans. I was shocked when I came to realize how much of the world's population lives at less than 10 meters above sea level. At least 12% of the population, 710 million people of the world, live less than 10 meters above the ocean mean level. When studying this, I found out that two-thirds of the world's largest cities, cities with 5 million people or more, are located less, at least less in part than 10 meters above sea level. And more people are moving to those cities every day. You'll generally find those cities at the mouths of rivers and often built on deltas created by silt of the rivers where they join the ocean. Locating our cities in such a manner created two problems. 
One, of course, is the risk of massive storms and ocean rising. Another is the problem of subsidence. Several cities are suffering with issues of subsidence, which exasperates for them the problem of rising oceans. As the weight of the city increases, uh, it causes the delta, delta, delta land to settle. This settling is also exasperated by the rising ocean level, which adds to the saturation of the delta soil, making them even more subject to subsidence. We can see the results of that in Mexico. In Mexico City, we see the downtown settling where buildings tilt this way and that way. The city was built on an ancient lake. It was not built on firm soil. Several of the cities are located in the United States. I decided to look at Miami-Dade and was shocked to find that the average elevation of Miami-Dade is six feet, 1.8 meters above sea level. The highest point in Miami-Dade County is 40 feet. Over 5.5 million residents of Miami live at less than six feet above mean tide. The 2015 tax value of real, real property in Miami-Dade is $230 billion. The $230 billion is only based on private real property. We have to think about the values of public buildings, the roads, sidewalks, and bridges, the water and sewer systems, the health care facilities, the airport, the parks, the athletic fields, and the many public universities found in Miami Dade. All of those values add to the financial value. When you add it to the 5.5 million people living under six feet, um, it will bring massive destruction. The wealth of most Americans is found in their homes. In like manner, the debt of most Americans is found in the mortgage on their homes or business property. For the rich, most of their wealth is in equities and investments. For the poor, it's generally only in their personal property. And for the middle class, it's their home. As individuals begin to realize the risk they are facing, they will start liquidating their real property. As people see their neighbors are selling their homes, they too, most likely, will want to sell their property. More homes in the market means falling prices. As more panic evolves, the value of their homes go down. For most people, this is the principal holding that they have worked for their entire life. Houses will be worthless. Houses will be worth less than their mortgage and will be underwater. Ironically, underwater is a term that mortgage bankers use. <laughs> Soon the houses will have no value as there will be no market. The ripple effect caused under this scenario was endless. Where do people relocate? Where do their children go to school? Where do they find jobs to support their parents? What housing will be available? How will they afford it? The list goes on and on. I think of the many major cities around the world. All we have to do is to look at New Orleans, to look at Haiti, Haiti to look at areas in Malaysia, which were all devastated by storms. Then we need to look at the Middle East to see the impact of massive migration of people from Syria and their neighboring countries to get a glimpse of the impact of such calamities. Now, why would I think this might be possible? According to Harvard scientist Jerry Mitrovac, the paleoclimatic Halo climate record suggests that even a slight amount of global warming can produce a sea level rise of 7 to 10 meters. That's 25 to 32 feet. The long-term effects of that can cause the sea level rise to be 25 meters, 82 feet. With 12% of the world's population, 710 million people living within 10 meters, less than 33 feet of sea level, and 21%, which is 1.3 billion people, living within 25 meters of sea level, we have every reason to be concerned. 
The polar regions have enough water stored as ice sheets to raise the ocean 67 meters. That's 220 feet. As the ice sheet melts, it causes a negative loop. The melting of the ice sheet causes a regional cooling of the ocean. That leads to latitudinal temperature changes and effects, which will drive an increase in powerful cyclonic storms continually moving toward Lena for centuries to come. I had always thought that, that the concept of water rising to its own level, level was a given. Remember in the bathtub or the rubber ducky? I did not understand that when you study the planet and its oceans, that you also have to factor in the gravitational effects of ice and land mass on the distribution of ocean water. The rapid melting of the ice sheets of the Arctic create a reduction of the gravitational effect. That will cause the ocean levels of Scotland, Newfoundland, and Greenland to dramatically fall. While the coastal areas closer to the equator, it will increase. In like manner, the rapid, rapid melting of the West Antarctica and Antarctica ice sheet will reduce the gravitational pull, which draws some, uh, substantial amounts of ocean water to the South Pole. As the polar waters of the ocean fall, there is a corresponding rise elsewhere. An average of 30 feet rise in the ocean would see a 40 to 50 foot rise in the ocean in some areas and a 10 to 20 foot fall in others. The Florida and southeast coastal areas of the United States will be one of the areas affected by great increases in ocean levels. Now I have to ask myself just how do we get to such a place? Regardless of what political system has been in place, perpetual growth has always been part of the politics. Part of the reason has been the growing population, and part has been greed. When we look at the population clock as it relates to evolving population growth, we, we find that it took from the dawn of humankind until 1800 for there to be one billion people running around on the earth. It only took 130 additional years until 1930 to reach two billion. At 30 years, and you reach 3 billion, billion. 15 more, 1974, we make it to 4 billion people. The following 13 years, we make it to 5 billion. The 20th century saw the world's population rise from 1.65 billion to 6 billion. The United Nations population clock projects there will be an increase of 50% to 9 billion people by 2038, and by 2056, there will be 10 billion people. So in the first half of the 21st century, we will have increased from 6 billion to 10 people billion, running around the Earth, all looking for food and shelter. The 10 countries of the world with the most people living in low coastal areas are China, India, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia, Japan, Egypt, Thailand, the Philippines, and the United States. If there are 5.5 million people at risk just in Miami-Dade County, the number of people around the world who will be in equal straits is unbelievable. And that's why I chose Dr. Kinkin's words for my presentation. The fierce urgency of now. I'm going to close by asking my wife to read Dr. King's speech, or his sermon, just a brief part of his sermon. Uh, to, you know, there's such insightful uh, words. Trish? We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. Life often leaves us standing bare, naked and dejected with a lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of man does not remain at the flood, it ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. 
Over the bleached bones and jumbled residue of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. There is an invisible book of life that faithfully records our vigilance or our neglect. The moving finger writes, and having writ moves on. We still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. And I trust with all my heart that we will not be too late. Explain to us the slogan, System Change, Not Climate Change. Gregory. Thank you. Oh, Dick, I'm glad I'm old. As Naomi Klein suggests in her book, This Change is Everything, system change is needed to counteract the ongoing serious and negative changes to the biosphere that she and others have so well delineated. However, in the discussion regarding the challenges that we and future generations face, there are some concepts and realities described in a somewhat muddy way that need to be clarified if we are to build a movement for meaningful change. We will need to discuss the role of capitalism, both as a producer of nature and the human society we live in how we think about this, and if we even do think of this, will shape our and future generations' responses to ecological crises. Geologists and paleontologists have named the past 11,700 years the Holocene area, era. Lately, scientists and commentators have characterized the past 200 years or so as the Anthropocene era, as an indication of the time of increased human domination of nature. A number of scholarly journals have sprung up with a version of that name in the title, and just last week, some reports were released both in the US and Europe promoting this concept. I myself have used this term on a panel here last year and other places for several years, but as I have studied its use, I, have, I find that is a term that obfuscates more than it illuminates. Many of us on the left, and not only on the left, concerned about recent changes to the biosphere, unconsciously adhere to a Cartesian division. That is, the original mind-body cleavage that the philosopher René Descartes proposed is no longer accepted by many. However, when it comes to our biosphere, we seem to be stuck in a division between nature on the one hand and society on the other. This division, this way of thinking, can easily lead, in the most reductive sense, to a positing of nature good, humans bad, and the solution proposed is to just leave nature alone and get out of its way and by somehow reducing the bad things we are doing, it will heal itself. However, I maintain that in our era, there is no itself, nature, without humanity. Of course, there are many who will agree and state that people are a part of the nature, but as one absorbs their ideas, this nature-society cleavage uh, raises its head. We need to think and act on a primary concept of humanity in nature and nature in humanity in order to really understand the entanglement, the joining illustrated by that phrase. But we need to go a step further and critique the concept of the Anthropocene. The naming of the past 200 years or so as the Anthropocene, firstly, reduces humanity in all of its variety to an abstract 
concept. Where in that abstraction is there room to speak of the commodification of nature and of our lives? Racism, capitalism, patriarchy, imperialism, etc. Ultimately, that concept can be, and often is, reduced to a form of individualism, and individualism's often attended guilt married to an idea of domination. I'll come to that again. Secondly, as an abstraction, it is ahistorical and limits our analysis to it of, it, of geographic space to a thing created by society with only a brief nod, if any, to nature. Our world is just not that simple. It is time to introduce a new word used by Jason Moore and others that is ugly. The capital O C. An admittedly ugly and clumsy word for an ugly system. Capitalocene, capital. <laughs> Anthropocene, but capitalocene. I'll explain. It is an ugly word. Um, an admittedly ugly word for an ugly system. However, it does help us to put history and the creation of geographic space, which you talked a lot about, uh, in the forefront of our thinking. It also allows us to posit the crucial concept of capitalism in nature, and nature in capitalism, as a historical adjunct to the previously mentioned humanity in nature, and nature in humanity. To refine and define it further, the capitalocene is the era shaped by relations that privilege the endless accumulation of capital. The relentless drive for profit and its attendant creation of waste and destruction characterize this era. The Anthropocene is often defined as beginning in the 18th century and the start of the Industrial Revolution. However, I believe that the Capitalocene began much earlier in Europe, during the 16th century, as capitalist relations in society began to take hold. Conquest of much of the non-European world began, along with unending commodification. Accumulate, accumulate, accumulate became the watchword, and the creation of capital was the talisman that aided in the transformation of our world. Capitalism is thus not only a way of organizing society, it is also a way of organizing nature. Nature works for capitalism, and just as we humans are often so alienated from our work and society, so are we alienated from nature, and we have thus made it a thing that is outside of ourselves. I'm going back to that society, nature cleavage, coming from Descartes originally. As an example of this, of the things being that nature being made outside of ourselves, capitalist biogenetics transforms nature into, quote, intellectual property, end quote. A legal concept integral to the oppressive trade agreements now being negotiated. Corporations and governments accumulate by appropriation knowledge humans have learned over generations, and then they can modify it, make it into products over which the original people have no control, and neither do we. This lends a new insubstantiality to nature and our place in and of it. We oscillate from a fear of nature to grandiose fantasies, sometimes realized, of domination of nature. The ecology of fear could develop into a predominant form of global capitalism through commodification of nature and other schemes of green capitalism. 
which you and Naomi touched upon in the book. Today, nature seems even more strange from us as we delve even deeper into biogenetics and artificial intelligence. Our view of nature has changed so that we often see it as no longer natural. We are modifying genomes to good and ill effect, and where that will lead is unknown. Our fear of nature is at a new level. The capital of C is when humanity and nature, nature in humanity, trembles. But this trembling or terror should lead to an acceptance of what has already been lost and a recognition of what is the increasing commodification of nature. If we embrace our fear and accept our terror, it may help to clear our minds, to sharpen our thinking. Acceptance and recognition of these realities leads to the necessity of system change, a political project of transcending capitalism. Terror allows us to accept the contingency of our existence. There is no place to return to, no garden of Eden. There is no looking back. We can only look forward. Where do we go from here? Well, we will need to realize that our future is bleak. We have already passed or are approaching a number of ecological tipping points. There will be catastrophes. And against this acceptance, we will need to mobilize to change the system and thus change our destiny. The folly of limited means must be rejected. The choice is between anticipating a disaster and doing some major things now. And if the catastrophe does not occur, we risk seeming foolish, or doing nothing and lose everything. Taking the middle road means we fail. Either a catastrophe or catastrophes will happen, or it won't. As Jim Hightower pithily put it, the only things in the middle of the road are yellow lines and dead armadillos. <laughs> our task, and that of our children, is to build a world that is both habitable and just. In order to do that, we must have a strategic vision that unites the global and the local in struggle. They are not opposites, but different dimensions of the scalar matrix of the size of the world markets. In order to affect system change, it will be good to keep in mind Antonio Gramsci's dictum that we who want to change the world need to have optimism of the will married to pessimism of the intellect. Ruthless criticism will be needed for the mistakes we will make while reaching into the past to change our futures. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so it's certainly appropriate to wear this button. I see that Kathy's wearing it also. And I think this segues perfectly into George Ann's talk about the rights of nature not to be commodified, and the work that children, children are doing with the Children's Trust to sue to protect their future, saving the environment. So, George Ann. Um, I'm going to start with a statistic and probably end with that same one because I want you all to remember. 80% 80, 80 of our proven fossil fuel reserves, meaning they are still under the ground, are on the indigenous lands of the Americas. Say that again, please. I'm going to say it again, and then it's not going to end with it, because I want you to remember it. Eight percent of proven, the last proven reserves of fossil fuels that are still under the ground, but they know where they are, are on the indigenous lands of the Americas. 
So I just think that's a very important thing. Remember, it ties into my talk. I'm going to speak about the rights of nature, and in starting, I'm going to tell my own story, which I realize has grown and developed over the years. And in saying that, maybe it'll explain how this concept of rights of nature has grown and developed and where it is right now. Um, I go to a Binders conference almost every year, and I have since 1999, and somewhere around 2004, 2005, one of the speakers was a fellow named Thomas Lindsay. Um, he looked like, you know, he's the khaki pants, short haircut, striped shirt, looking like a Republican. Um, and I think maybe he does that on purpose since he's a lawyer and has to go into the courtrooms. But he's a, a passionate speaker, and his story so captivated me that I ended up going to one of the democracy schools. But first off, he spoke about how as a, a lawyer, this would be maybe in the 70s or 80s sometime, when he got out of law school in Pennsylvania, he wanted to do something in this beginning field of environmental law. So he and a partner started together. And their first cases were with, let's say that a community was complaining about some business upstream dumping, let's say Flint, Michigan, lead in the water. Anyway, does something toxic in the water. And they wanted to address that. So Thomas Lindsay and his partner started out with cases like this where the of course, the complaint has to be made to the Environmental Protection Agency. And then the community and the Environmental Protection Agency and the lawyers go like this, and it always ends up, he found out, with them, the EPA regulating at what speed you can poison an ecosystem. <laughs> it slows down the speed. So after a while of that, these two guys, <coughs> particularly Thomas Lindsay, got the image, there's no use staying in this system and addressing environmental law in this framework. So he started uh, a nonprofit CELDF, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Don't worry, I have all of this with all these handouts. <laughs> uh, and they started then with, actually it was interesting, the rural part of Pennsylvania apparently, I don't know it that well, is in the, in the middle of the country, and that's the Republican part of the country. And they had some small communities come to them, find out about them, being able to address this in a different way of toxic poisoning of, in this case, it was their fields. And when they found out that they couldn't do anything because state law, which the lobbyists had been busy making sure it was going to be right for them, um, state law would trump the community rights. The thing that put community, the CELDF on the map and this kind of rights of nature on the map, at least at that place and time, was two teenage boys walked across a farmer's field which had been, which waste materials from hospitals in New Jersey and New York who could no longer dump there, but could move it to Pennsylvania and dump it in, in agricultural communities. In fact, they would pay the farmers and the farmers went, Oh, you know, that'll, all this manure will help improve the growth of our fields. These two boys walked across it to the woods on the other side and came back and they were sick and one of them died. And uh, his name, actually, I remember is Daniel Pennant because they have named the democracy schools after this 17-year-old kid who, who died from crossing the farmer's field <coughs> and the toxic materials that were put onto that field. So that was the beginning of then with small communities in the middle of Pennsylvania hearing this tale and when something, it could even be box stores, but certainly something toxic, waste dump, um, box stores that you don't want, anything that were coming into the community, what they would do is Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund develop what they call democracy schools. And democracy schools are three-day intensive course for community members to kind of get the big picture view from the Magna Carta on down into current contemporary American jurisprudence law. And then, then the next step would be 
to have uh, the political of that community, meaning their, uh, the people on their city council. And they would try to pass the rights of their community against whatever this was they didn't want to come into the community. And if they had to do the politics of having a recall election because it wasn't going to vote their way, they were encouraged, you run yourself, you know, you in the community that don't want this in. So that's how they were helped communities to then write into their ordinances that X, Y, or Z could not be come, come into their community and cause harm. Well, in effect, whatever corporation that was would move on instead of taking on a lawsuit. They would just move to a community mm -hmm. that also had the fields or whatever to, to dump and move on. So that's sort of been the history of that. There's one township or county, uh, there's a Tamaqua County, anyway, there's one in Pennsylvania who has been the first county or legal township, I'm not sure what's the legality of township or county, but to declare rights of nature and that rights of nature as an ecological system in and of itself, living rights, that, that, that their ecological system has a right to regenerate and do its own natural process and therefore X, Y, or Z cannot come in. Uh, since then, one of the latest in the U.S. was uh, Spokane, Washington as a city has now got the rights of nature into its framework. What I've seen over this of, of going rights of nature, I'm sure when I say it, it sort of sounds like some little obscure something that might protect frangy panties in Hawaii or something. I don't, but it's, it's really actually uh, a huge concept because if it works itself into the jurisprudence system at whatever level that it does, it then prohibits damage to the environment of that legal entity. Now, you can, since this was eight or nine years ago, well, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I went to one of the democracy schools. I went to one, it just happened to be, I was in contact with the ELDN, and my mother and sister and I were doing a little trip around the South, and I wanted to get off, go to a democracy school wherever I was going to be. So I ended up in, I think it was Northwestern Virginia, uh, going to one of their three-day democracy schools. The issue in that community was they were a little narrow valley community, and they were, one exit was on a lake, and some railroad corporation wanted to take out the middle of the town, basically, to make more tracks. And so that was their issue, the same thing. They were shocked that they had no power to stop this from happening. So this was the democracy school, and there were maybe 20, 25 of us um, in this democracy school. Um, and of course, everybody there, maybe everybody was from that community, Shereen and then the organizers. Um, one of the fellows, Richard, he since died, but he was, he had a name in the civil rights era that I remembered. They were one of the teachers of this, of the school, and of course, people in the workshop wanted to know what I was doing <laughs> living in Mexico. What was I doing there with their issue? And I said, I just am very curious about how these democracy schools work because I felt that they really had application across the country to help communities defend themselves basic, basically against corporations, against corporate power. And I just wanted to see how it worked. So that's why I was there. Uh, since then, a few years after that, or some, some, around 2007, Ecuador was redeveloping, this was renewing a constitution. They were rewriting it. Interesting, I thought that congressional members of Ecuador were the ones who did this, not citizens, but citizens voted on it. That's interesting, too, at the, at the end of the parts of it. And some guy who had been to Bioneers knew one of these congressmen, and they were talking about this problem of, of corporations, particularly in this case the oil corporations in Ecuador. Um, they were talking about the problem, and he said, oh, there's this fellow Thomas Lindsay that can help. 
help them. So Thomas and Lindsay went to Ecuador and helped them in the legalese of how to write it into their constitution about rights of nature. So Ecuador, and I think Bolivia has now done the same. A lot of particularly smaller countries I know have consulted with them since then about how do you do this. And so Ecuador has rights of nature written into its constitution that the famous Chevron case was before, during, and after that. But I think in 2013, the Villa Combo River in Ecuador was being polluted by something, again, an upstream case. And some residents took that case to the Supreme, all the way to the Supreme Court of Ecuador. And so the Villa Combo River is the first institute of nature to be protected by the rights of nature. So that was a kind of a first in this jurisprudence. I'm going to um, read to you a little bit of wording from the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Then I'm going to end with the most exciting development in that arena. Um, at the, Rachel Carson said that in a healthy, a healthy environment is one of the basic human rights. Today, legal systems around the world treat nature as property under the law and thus rightless. Treated as property, environmental laws regulate the use of nature such as these laws legalize environmental harm. Under this legal framework across the globe, ecosystems and species are facing collapse. A fundamentally different relationship between humankind and nature is necessary, one that recognizes our dependence on nature and the need to live in harmony with the natural world. This requires providing the highest legal protection and thus placing the highest societal value on nature and sustainability by recognizing the rights of both humankind and nature to health and well-being. Uh, this is a, some about the environmental laws on the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Rather than preventing pollution and environmental destruction, our environmental laws codify it. In the U.S., for example, under the Clean Water Act and the Surface Mining Control and Re Reclamation Act, coal corporations are authorized to blow the tops off mountains. Mm -hmm. Under state oil and gas laws, corporations are authorized to frack, mine, and drill. Under these laws, ecosystems and species are facing collapse. In the U.S., title to property carries with it the legal authority to destroy the natural communities and ecosystems that depend upon that property for survival. In fact, federal environmental laws were passed under the authority of Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution, which grants exclusive authority over interstate commerce to Congress. Treating nature to commerce as commerce has meant that all existing environmental law frameworks in the U.S. are anchored in the concept of nature as a commodity, as an item of property. This legal framework is mirrored around the world. We have to move from a property to a rights-based framework to protect nature. CELDF has assisted communities in the U.S. as well as the country of Ecuador to develop the first rights of nature laws. These laws change the status of natural communities and ecosystems from being regarded as property under the law to being recognized as rights-bearing entities. These laws recognize that natural communities and ecosystems possess an inalienable and fundamental right to exist and flourish, and that people possess the legal authority to enforce those rights on behalf of nature. In addition, they require the governments to remedy violations of ecosystem rights. They do not stop development, whether they stop development and use of property that interferes with the existence and vitality of those ecosystems. Um, I'll just, I read, in 2011, the Provincial Justice Court of Loja ruled in favor of the Vilcabamba River, making it the first time that the promulgation of the rights of nature provisions in the Ecuador Constitution, that a court upheld constitutional rights of nature. In the United States, in November 2014, CELDF filed the first motion to intervene in a lawsuit by an ecosystem. 
the ecosystem, the Little Mahogany Watershed in Grant Township, Indiana County, Pennsylvania, sought to defend its own legal rights to exist and flourish. Um, so that is what the CELDF has seen myself from first hearing about it and thinking of rights of nature as kind of an obscure, abstract entity. I've come to see how its application, its possibility for application to local frameworks, state framework, larger, even international frameworks, can come to be, once you do that, you don't have to then fight in the court. You don't have to take on the same fights that we have to now to defend a local community or a local ecosystem. Um, another one in, in that one is our Children's Trust, which was Bill Moyer's last show with the lawyer Mary Christina Wood. Um, I think they're from Oregon. I always mix it up with Seattle or Oregon. But Oregon, okay. <laughs> um, so that is also something that young people have joined with this lawyer in taking on the, uh, the issue of protecting a community and the ecosystem within that community in the judicial system. And I believe that not too long ago that the Supreme Court judge at the state level uh, validated the children, this children live meeting for their future. Um, validated that lawsuit at that point. So our children's trust is something that's on the map that's also very important. And I want to show a couple, of, I have handouts of everything I've said. Um, this I want to be sure to point out. Some of these, the woman's place is in the hat, in the revolution. <laughs> this is the women that started I Don't Know More in Canada, which has turned to be a very important uh, movement. So that I have photos here you can see later. I want to point out, this is Tom Goldtooth, who's a um, Lakota Navajo mixture from Minnesota. He's the fellow that started, I saw him speak for nine years too, and when I saw him going on an Ecuador trip, I signed up. And they gave my Maya friend, Ishki, a scholarship to go on that trip because we, the trip was about the rights of nature, and it was the first time a North American indigenous person had gone to where the Ashwar people in South America um, meeting together over the rights of nature. And I wrote to the <coughs> drama that did the trip and asked them if they would give each people a scholarship. She just graduated in law, and so she's active in her community. So that's Tom Goldtu, who started the Indigenous Environmental Network, which I, when I got home the other day, got on the site. Boy, that was hooping and hollering because probably the very latest thing is Leonardo DiCaprio addressed the UN and talked about the importance of an indigenous environmental rights and, and this, you know, IEN, you've probably never heard of it. I never had either until I went to Bioneers and, you know, Tom Botoon's work. So there are a lot of indigenous peoples. They are the ones on the front lines. And when you think of 80% of the fossil fuel reserves being in the Americas on indigenous lands, they are literally on the front lines. And I wanted to, um, to talk about the last thing that's, that's very current is the tribunal in Paris. And I'm going to, the tribunal in Paris, where we didn't hear any of this, what the uh, Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature did was, ha they did one in Quito two years ago, in Lima last year, and this year in Paris. They held their own in their own auditoriums. What they do is have a tribunal that's made of different lawyers from different countries, different plaintiffs from different countries. Almost all of these are indigenous people because that's whose lands are being affected. Um, they have a case presented for the damage in X community and in, in, in X country, and they have a defense and a, and a prosecutor, and the judges of this hear this and, and decide the cases. And what this does is it makes it makes the judicial process that could be have its own play out in a people's tribunal. 
So, of course, we didn't see that on TV. Um, but I have one of my handouts, and I will read from one of the tribunal offers earth driven, not market driven solutions to climate change. This is some of the panel from the People's Tribunal. And I'm just going to read some of the parts of it. The Third International Tribunal for the Rights of Nature. People flock to the Maison de Métaillon in Paris to listen to more than 65 people from 32 nationalities speaking in seven languages who to participate as judges, earth defenders, defenders or witnesses during the two days of tribunal hearings. More than 600 people attended the hearings on each of the two days and hundreds more had to be turned away due to lack of space. The participants of the tribunal showed the strong united leadership so lacking at COP21 by signing the People's Convention that formally established the tribunal which opened the way to the creation of regional tribunals throughout the world. The tribunal bases its judgments primarily on the Universal Declaration for the Rights of Mother Earth and International Human Rights Law also recognized ecocide as a crime. That particular declaration of the rights of Mother Earth, uh, on that trip to Ecuador, I met the woman who started that, and it's on my list that you can pick up and take with you of things you can do. It's now um, got like 860,000 signers. I think when it hits the million mark, it might get some press and some news. So these People's Tribunal will begin putting into manifestation what the regular government level did not have happening in Paris and show, determine that people can be witnesses to epicide and communities and have at least some judgment whether it's binding or not uh, given out on, the, on that. Uh, the proposed solutions to climate change being presented at COP21 are abstract, theoretical, <coughs> theoretical, market driven, not earth driven, and motivated by self interest. That the hearings of the tribunal couldn't have been more different. Its findings were based on scientific and other expert testimony from the first hand experiences of witnesses and drew on both scientific knowledge and the cosmovision, the worldview, and wisdom of indigenous and local communities. The focus was on listening to nature and was based on the recognition that nature's laws cannot be broken, an understanding that appears to be absent from COP21. If you want to read more on this, you can take it with you. I just want to close my talk with a couple of things. One, back to 80% of proven fossil fuel reserves are on indigenous lands in the Americas. And I just would like to make paint the picture, which is not mine, but taken from indigenous peoples, that Here's the map of the Americas. The boreal forest up in northern Canada and the Amazon forest in South America are the biggest, they are the two lungs of our planet. They are the biggest expanses of forest that clean carbon out of the air and breathe it and clean again. And if you can imagine, let's say, go to the map in Central America and bring those like two lungs in our Earth body breathing and cleaning and to realize that most of that is dependent right now most of it is dependent on the actions of indigenous peoples and so I'm going to close with this because you hear often what can one person do what can I do for one you can do like I do you can talk <laughs> no, I'm serious. You can pass on information. Almost all of your family and friends do not know the information that's been shared here today. You can pass that on, and as far as working in communities, whether it's San Miguel or, or anywhere in the world, some of you have probably heard of transition networks that was started in England to get a town and community fossil free to provide jobs, etc. There are now hundreds of these transition towns around the world. So for working in your community or telling your family and friends about how they can work in their community, this certainly has 
can show you some steps to take. And then for other things, the dot boards, some of the dot boards that I like to support, and I can only say, all retired people can give money, even if it's five dollars a month. We can all give, I do give five dollars a month. So here are the ones that you can give that are directly working with rights of nature and or indigenous peoples. I have the sheets here. The Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Indigenous Environmental Network, Tom Goldtooth, and all of them celebrating right now because we have all of the Caprio brought attention to them. I don't know more in Canada. Amazon Watch is very good for all of the issues of dams and, and oil companies and stuff in the Brazil, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. Amazon Watch. And this one, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, and I forgot to put on here, the, our Children's Trust. So, our Children's Trust. All of those are very worthy organizations that you can tell people to give money to and you can give your own uh, amounts. And that's the way, without going to those actions, without being an indigenous person on the front lines, yet knowing they are the ones that are and it's their lands that if they're stripped like the tar sands that's going to end up poisoning all of us. That's something very effective, I think, that we can do. And then down here is the rightsofmotherearth.org for that international petition for rights of nature and rights of mother earth. Um, personally, I think, you know, like we talked about systems change and that whole mindset of what it is and the divide between nature and people. Again, most indigenous peoples, even today, don't have that same divide of mentality that, that we Westerners have. And, and nature and community and living and breathing are much more co much more coherent knowledge system. So that at the same time. I just want to share one more personal picture, not to do with I mean, but this is looking down from the top of the government building in Guatemala City that hundreds of thousands of demonstrators, they changed the government. Mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. so, um, that's thank you. So, Jen not only does a good job talking, she's very generous about sharing her extensive library of films, books, and articles. We've all benefited right. from her generosity. Oh, <laughs> speaking of that, oh, people no. in here that are, I have decided that on John Perkins' birthday, which is January 28th, I am cleaning out my office, and I've already got boxes of books, good books, all nonfiction, comedy, <laughs> politics, and I'm going to have a tequila sour and book giveaway. <laughs> if you drink a tequila sour, you must go home with a book. If you have read two, you have to go home with two books. So I know that all of you, like, from my regular groups, I have your emails. But if some of them want to come to celebrate John Perkins birthday, I'm giving away good books. Just let me know your emails. And he's coming to Seattle so, for the Writers' Conference. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm still in Seattle. Yes, he is. For the writer. The writer. Well, that's <laughs> right. And then I order a cab to take you home. <laughs> no, then you'll buy all of them. No, no, these are giveaways. I want them. I just don't, oh, want, I just don't want my good books to go to the library where not everybody would find them. appreciate this. Is good stuff. Okay, let's open it up to questions, comments. A lot of information. Well, James and then. Yeah, uh, thanks very much for your knowledge and your insights. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, these uh, presentations could be made available online. What uh, perhaps the center's website? Yep, they would be. Thank you, Chris, for videotaping. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jack. Grand Art Gregory, I was interested in systems delivery change. Can you give me an example? Or did you give me an example and I didn't get it? 
<laughs> you said the word delivery. I don't do delivery. Okay. <laughs> um, systems change. System change. Well, basically the system we live under is capitalism. I'm a socialist. Uh, what I'm looking for is, a, is I'm looking for. What I, I think many are looking for is a, is a change of that system, the way people relate to each other, and that the, uh, the profit mode of the accumulation of capital is the dominant, uh, let's say, thing that is done in the system and that drives the whole system. And it needs to be changed in a way that people are relating more to themselves, take democratic control of their work, of their communities, of all ways of doing things, uh, and are producing things more for use than just to make a profit to sell. Because out of that comes a tremendous amount of waste. Uh, just buy anything today, and you see a lot of cheaply made stuff, which you know is made to break down in just a couple of years. Um, I've had this phone for 10 years, they laugh at me, you know, you still have an old phone or you don't have a smartphone or whatever, and, but every few years you're supposed to change so many of these things. So an integral part of the system in making it solely for profit and secondarily, not for, primarily for profit and secondarily for use, it has to be useful of course, is this built-in obsolescence and creating of waste, which of course is another challenge ecologically. What do you do with all the waste? George Ann talked about the kids who walked across this field and became ill from all the medical waste that was there. Uh, in Pennsylvania, again, in the Susquehanna River, I personally saw, was involved in, where toxic waste was dumped in the river in caves along the side of the river, but covered over by when the river was high. When, the, when there was drought levels and the river went low, it all of a sudden exposed all these 50-gallon drums of toxic waste that had been dumped there. So the creation of, of huge, huge amounts of waste is integral to the capital system. And not only waste of things, but waste of people. So, very briefly, and we can talk more about it, but I'm talking about a different way of people relating to each other, relating within and of the, to and of the environment, uh, and uh, obviously in terms of how things are produced. And there's a whole democratic deficit. I mean, this is a whole other long discussion. I know that in next week's panel that Cliff <coughs> mentioned next Wednesday, I think that's going to be the focus uh, of that, or you know, a, certainly a focus of the discussion, because it's going to say, what is socialism, different kinds of socialism, what does it mean, what are people looking for? Because of course, with you know, Bernie Sanders running, that has gained a lot of traction from becoming a dirty word, which it wasn't in America. You have socialists running for president before, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century as an example. So anyway, that's just a brief, very superficial uh, answer to your profound question. Quite profound, um, Yeah, on, on this point, uh, a question I want to raise with, with Gregory. One of the ambiguities in Naomi Klein's book is, uh, though the title says capitalism versus the climate, it's not clear whether her argument really is that it's capitalism per se, or is it what she calls the extreme capitalism of market fundamentalism or neoliberal capitalism? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, basically, her argument focuses on that extreme capitalism as the uh, you know as the source of the um, damaging effect on the climate. You could push that a step further and say, well, that comes out of corporate capitalism. Uh, it's the formation of these huge capitalist firms, corporations, whose reach is far, whose need to ever accumulate more and more is endless. 
um, and who are far removed from those areas, uh, whether they be ge geographic areas that they extract wealth from, or the communities that they destroy, etc. So you could say, well, okay, market fundamentalism is, is the main problem now, but broader than that, it is corporate capitalism. Um, but if that's the case then, and this is my question to you, is there a form of capitalism that would not be injurious to the environment, would not be driven by the endless need to accumulate more and more, uh, raping the environment in the process? I mean, the kind of capitalism, if you want to call it that, um, that existed on a local level for centuries with local businessmen who were making a profit, um, but lived in the community and had a sense of responsibility to the community and to the environment in which they lived. Um, that was not destructive of the environment in the way that corporate capitalism is. So is that form of local capitalism, petty bourgeois enterprise, not, uh, not incompatible with uh, um, living in harmony with nature? So I have a one word answer. No. <laughs> uh, but let me go back because you, you raise a lot of points. Uh, the ambiguity that you talk about in, in Naomi Klein's every really important and excellent book is something, you know, I recognize and I was saying it to my wife Irene yesterday, you know, just the same kinds of things, but not in the detail that you did. Um, look, I don't even know what corporate capitalism means. There's always been corporations. As I mentioned, going back to the 16th century, the 17th century, we had the East India Company. They conquered a whole country. They ruled India. You had the Dutch East Indies Company. These were all corporate. When you set up uh, colonies in the United States in the 17th century, the English crown granted corporations. Corporations, per se, as a legal structure, are several hundred years old and are a legal structure developed under capitalism to help fulfill the uh, mission, if, if one will, of, of capitalism. Now, what Cliff is referring to perhaps is more of a stranglehold of it. But capitalism has always been, uh, the modus operandi is to accumulate, is to create profit, is uh, to create things that can be sold at a profit, and the exploitation of the people and the land and nature comes <coughs> along with it, is part and parcel of it. One cannot, dis in my opinion, excuse me, one cannot disentangle the two. They are intimately related. Uh, so we have a kind of, I think what you brought up was a kind of romanticized idea of, oh, there's this small community. It reminds me of these movies of the Old West, you know, with Gary Cooper or something. Uh, no, I mean, the, the amount of, uh, when was that? I mean, the amount of exploitation that was going on in people of nature was the same thing. It was a time of, in the United States, as an example, tremendous industrialization <coughs> of the buildup of the steel industry, <coughs> of the buildup of, uh, of the automobile industry that was attendant in all of these things. So I, I think that, uh, you know, Cliff knows that many times I've uh, used an old Greek myth of the um, scorpion and the frog, uh, and um, you know one of Aesop's fables, but it's the nature. You know, it's the nature of the scorpion to sting, uh, to sting, even if it's going to mean destruction for itself. And it's in the nature of capitalism. It is a function of capitalism to exploit nature, to exploit people, to create tremendous amounts of waste, and so forth and so on. And I think, you know, we've seen the, the under what is called the neoliberal era of the last 30 years, which has to somewhat changed things where financialization has been so important, uh, that this is what Naomi Klein is reacting to. 
But it's another outgrowth of the way cap capitalism is the most incredibly adaptive social system that humans have ever created. That's my opinion. And it finds new ways, it finds new ways to adapt all the time. One of the adaptations, which I touched on in my paper, but I've got other things that I can give people to read, or, is about the commodification of nature and green capitalism and the financialization of it. That's growing. It's only going to get bigger. It may take over to be one of the main uh, sources of profit, the trading in carbon offsets, which is many people say, oh, that's a really good thing, is really a horrible thing. Mm -hmm. And I can go into that in detail, but this is maybe the place for it now. But mm -hmm. anyway, so it is inc capitalism is incredibly adaptive. And it is adapting all the time. And the neoliberal neo turn of the last 30 years increased financialization is one of those adaptations where capitalism could no longer make the kinds of profits that it could previously. Uh, and so there was a change. And now there's other changes which are happening right now. Yeah. Uh, can I speak to that first? Can I speak to that first? Sure. Okay. Because you're a panel. Yes, because I'm a panel. <laughs> you know, a couple of thoughts. Uh, I look, when I look at the world, there hasn't been one political system that has protected the environment. If you look at China, you see the damming of rivers that have destroyed massive amounts of people's rural people's land and agriculture. You find here that uh, Indian reservations, a corporation wants to get their copper or their coal or their silver. The Indians, because they're under the auspices of the Secretary of uh, Interior, get told, sorry, you've got to move. There's a concept in the United States called highest and best use. And it took me a long time to move away from that concept. And the concept is what has screwed up so many cities and towns and so many states. And that is if you're a private owner of land or a public owner of land, you know, if it's a government land, what's considered the best use of that land is that which produces the most value. So if a company wants to exploit something or put a new housing development in or all those things, if it produces a quote, what they say is a higher value, they get it, and the people that have it lose it. So one of the things we've got to do is change. One of the things we can do is talk to city council people and legislators about the false concept of highest and best use. That's just my thought. So Bill and then Sheila. Yeah, you're describing unregulated capitalism. Absolutely. It's who determines the best use of land? The people or corporations. Amen. If corporations are coming in and doing it, it's unregulated. People don't have a say, but we are in a democracy. Mm. Of the people, by the people, for the people. But we have politicians in Congress who are obviously connected more with corporations because of the input of money from elections and so forth. And they're not regulating. They're not regulating our doom. We could be saved in many ways if regulations apply to the people, not to corporations. And I'm, I'm into this now because of Obama's call last night, his, his final State of the Union, and he mentioned one of his goals this year is dealing with elections. And what is he talking about? He's talking about money influencing elections. Now we're back to corporations through super PACs regulating the people who are, this is not nothing new obviously, but it needs to be said over and over and over until something is done. And, uh, and corporations are not allowed to be people. They're people. Why? Because, well, you're allowed to, under the uh, First Amendment, you're allowed to contribute money to elections and people can contribute and if you restrict people, corporations from giving, that's, that's against the Constitution. But I think there is a sane approach, and if Obama, which is highly unlikely this last year, less than the last year, is going to get any kind of financial control over contributions to politicians, but if he can, or if the next president can, perhaps Bernie Sanders, or even 
Hillary will move in that direction. Regulations can work, and starting with the money that goes to elections and lobbyists to control politicians. It's sickening, absolutely sickening, to realize the majority of people want, the vast majority of people want government regulations in the climate. They're aware of climate change and the impact of fossil fuels. Nothing's being done. Why is that? We know why. And that's, it's absolutely insane. It doesn't make any sense that the people we elect are not representing us. So there's a problem with democratic capitalism. Democracy is not working for us because it's giving it to the corporations. So democracy is more of a problem, too, in the true sense of the word. It's not working. And he doesn't talk much about democracy being about corporations, but not democracy. Democracy is behind it. That's example that is. Okay, wait, 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 wait. I should have two okay, minutes. Okay, yeah. Well, Can let's I just try to keep our comments brief no, because no. I see a lot of hands Thank up you. and we Please want everybody to have a chance to no, speak. Totally so, Georgianne wants to say something. Then, Sheila, did you still want to make it? Okay, you had your. Okay, Georgianne, and then this okay. woman here, then Sally. I want to say that exactly what you're talking about that the only examples of real democracy that I've seen are communities regulating themselves and not waiting for the, the state level, the government level, that that is the potential of the application of rights of nature into the legal system small, okay? And that, that then when people are taking their own community's life into their hands and keeping out what they don't want, that's the best example in the United States right now that, that I've seen. And yes, it's obscure and small, but what if, what if, what if communities knew about it and more communities are, and more communities are doing it, but you can tell people, you can tell, I mean, really, that, that possibility in the legal system should be known by everybody. Okay, so. I just, I, I respectfully agree with what you said. I just also wanted to bring up the example of Norway as a country that is a democracy, but has managed to have regulations which I think are very, have benefited all the people there. So I think, I, I don't know what it's doing about the environment, but I think we do need to look for places where things are working a little bit, so we have some ideas of where we can go. And the film last night was, wait, wait, wait. Germany was a great example. Oh, okay. So Sally wanted to say something? Oh, Sheila, you do want to say something. Then Sally. No, no, that's just Oh. Okay, I just wanted to undermine what uh, Georgian said at the end with holding up the picture of what's happened in Guatemala. If that news were spread around the world, I mean, that would be, I would think, the big item of hope introduced in, in this decade. I mean, it's just the most repressive country, one of the most repressive countries on earth. And what they have done with throwing out their corrupt government now having charged and having their ex-president in jail, and now 18 of their ex-military who were involved in the genocide being arrested. And this is all coming from the people. It, and it started with demonstrations of 7,000, we all know, and it just went up into hundreds of thousands. And the one point that I want to make is that those people, it wasn't just the left wing in Guatemala. It wasn't just the Mayan people. It was people who have deep divisions who came together to throw these birds out and to make these arrests and let's hope that all, all can go forward. But George Ann, do you agree that this, if, why is this, you know, this news not, well, we know why it is. Well, actually the news is there if people want it. I just, Americans in general, what's the difference between Guadalajara and Guatemala? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so I think that it's not very much on the United States map. It's probably more on Europeans' map than in the maybe. U.S. No? Well, anyway, uh, so what can you do? You can't leave without my sheet of what you can do about <laughs> where you can talk and who you can tell and who you can give money to. Really, talking about these, Guatemala is an example um, th that you can send a news article to people people in the states, your email list or whatever, because it, Guatemala is just, it's still a shock, okay? The, the new president takes office in two days, Friday I think, and the people already have 
plan to, for thousands and thousands to be in the streets on the 16th and not just just to be there to say we're still here and that's the next part of it you can it's incredible that they brought down the government really incredible uh, and so it shows it's possible in other places for extreme corruption to be brought down peacefully but again the, the 16th demonstration of Guatemalans are going to have to stay on the streets to say we're still here. Okay, so Sally and then Jeff. Well, first I want to say thank you to all of you for all of the information that you've uh, given us. Very valuable. Um, I'm certainly, you know, for community organization, <coughs> um, I support that a lot. But um, in talking about corporate power, I think that we have to think about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific mm -hmm. Project, uh, which is about to come up for a vote, and I think in about three weeks. And that would trump, if it passes, it will trump all government regulations. Um, you can undo any, um, any regulations, any uh, community work that might uh, prevent them from uh, obtaining profits. If they lose profit, they can, they can actually sue countries. Um, so I think, it, you know, it's very serious and it worries me a lot. Uh, last night, uh, Obama, uh, he praised the TV. Um, that, that's very frightening to me. Uh, and I mean, the fact that it could undo uh, whatever communities might uh, come up with to save their uh, environment. So, can you tell me something hopeful? About the TTC? Did you want it? Yeah. Um. I can't tell you anything hopeful about TPP unless millions of people take to the street. But I know the Center for Global Justice and Occupy are going to try to do things at the market to try to get people more aware, so hopefully more people will turn out. But a, a couple of thoughts, one in terms of capitalism, and unbridled capitalism, you know. Corporations used to make, be able to make donations to communities to do good things. They used to be involved in all sorts of community activities. A hedge fund sued one of the corporations because it said the responsibility of a corporation was not to help a community, but to acquire money to pay dividends to their stockholders. So by the corporation giving money to a local community project, they were depriving the stockholders from their anticipated profit. It's almost like TPP, the loss of anticipated profit. So that's one thing in terms of unbridled capitalism. I mean, it's, you can't even be a good corporation anymore. Uh, so that's something we need to see if we can't get changed. Um, that's all I have to say right now. And Greg, comment. Well, one thing, just as an adjunct to what you're saying, one can create a corporation now which, with its mandate, and I forget the number under the tax law, um, that is mandated to give a certain amount of its net profits away right. to charities, to... The non corporation? No. Sure. Well, it's a different, but it's a, it's a different one that they created. Um, it's not, but, it's not excellent. <laughs> no, who, who, who just recently just pledged all their fortune using this particular uh, regular? No, they, they, they didn't use this. That's oh, they didn't? Different. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's setting up the foundation, and there's a lot of shim-sham and flimmy flamming going on around that as well. That's a whole other thing. Um, but, I mean, that, that whole thing is, is out of pressure of people wanting to do good, and also about a change in terms of the generation 18 to 34 who are called the millennials. Whether you know it or not, and I cheer this, 
we baby boomers are no longer the largest living cohort in the United States, but the millennials are. And when you pull them in terms of their political beliefs and their things, which they completely recognize by 80% global warming, they're in favor of equal rights, anti-racism, you know, all of those things, that's, that's good. You know, that, that's a hopeful thing that this younger generation, this 18 to 34 co cohort, which is now the largest, um, they don't vote. Maybe 60% of them say that they'll vote. So maybe that's something that will that will change. That you know has potential to help. Um, but uh, so I just wanted to mention there is this other thing, which I think is an outcome of the pressure of millennials who are starting corporations. But nevertheless, uh, the logic of capitalism is the logic of capitalism. I keep, sorry, I have to keep beating the same drum, maybe or sounding the same way or pessimistic, but I said, you know, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. Mm -hmm. I feel very good about the younger people today. I said this to someone else who was very cynical about that the other day at, at a party, um, and I truly believe that. And that's part of the function of we older people who have a history and a knowledge to try and pass that on, and the younger people have enthusiasm and fresh ideas that we don't have and couldn't have because they live in a different kind of a way. So we've got to all listen to each other and work together to make something strong, to make significant system change. I just wanted to make a comment too, because I realize what often happens in these discussions is what's not mentioned is the totally out of control military and defense contractors. And there was just a program on democracy now about this whole issue of why we have this alliance with Saudi Arabia. We gave them in over five years $90 billion in arms. So this, I mean, it's, it's a, this is this out of control system. And, and probably nobody talks about it because it's such an overwhelming But they only monster. use swords to behead people. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. Right. they do more beheadings than anyone. Well, that's your really to us. I, I really think of, I'm really thinking about the importance of community building. We lived through a number of hurricanes in Wilmington, North Carolina, and everybody <laughs> lost their power and they took their things out of their freezer and they set up their grills and everybody ate together because we were all in the same boat. We're not all in the same boat here. They're very unequal. We have a lot more money than the poor Mexicans or the rich Mexicans have a lot more money than we. But I think if we make an effort to build community, to surround ourselves with friends that, and people that we care about and that care about us, it's almost like a security blanket for us. And I don't know that we, that we really do that here so much. I think one of the conflicts that we face that kind of ties into what you said, we were at a gathering the other day, and this very environmentally conscious person collects all, he lives off his rainwater that he collects. He's totally in, uh, electricity independent. He has solar systems. He heats his hot water with a solar system. And this guy's really plugged into alternatives that can make a difference. The discussion, the discussion came up, though, and I think this is a conflict a lot of us have about the Keystone Pipeline. And, and this person happens to be Canadian, and how a Canadian company was suing under NAFTA, you know, for potential lost profit. Well, this guy has $25,000 of bonds in that company. <laughs> So he's sitting there on a balance. Does he protect his investment for his future? At the, you know, does he sacrifice that? You know, the other day, years, years ago, I'd moved my money out of the stock market because I was just scared to death of it and put it in cash. I sit on something that bears no value other than what people think the dollar's worth. And yesterday I saw what, or a couple days ago, I saw what happened to Apple. And the price was so low, I couldn't help but buy some. <laughs> now, Apple generates a lot of pollution in China. But, you know, here I am. I'm caught in this balance. How do I maintain myself from what's in here? And how do I promote also what's in here? So that's a conflict that we have to be able to wrestle with. 
and what the answer is that I don't know. <laughs> and that's the same with indigenous people live on this land, and most of them are poor. They live off the land, and they're struggling to feed their families and a big mining company comes in and they have to make a decision and offers them jobs and money. I mean, do I protect my land and my, the possible contamination of my water? Or do I feed my family? That's often a choice. So on a yeah, like that guy. He really is environmentally aware. He's a wonderful man. Strange. Okay. <laughs> it's a strange story. I just want to mention that everybody talks about the TPP. Uh, don't forget the TTIP, which is the European version of that. So there's two major ones. And just as an example, what Sally said just a week or so ago, uh, under NAFTA, both Mexico and Canada successfully sued the United States, and the United States was so scared, uh, over labeling of origin of meat or beef. And the consequence of that is not only talking about what they export to uh, Canada or Mexico from the U.S., but the labeling is changing now in the supermarkets in the United States because of that. So the threat, uh, what is, what that, that has already been instituted under NAFTA for all these years, and of course it's a, it's a really crucial part of the TPP and the TTIP, which are being negotiated now. So that's not... That's not going away, unfortunately. And intellectual property, which I mentioned in there, which is another form of uh, accumulation by theft, if you will, uh, is by appropriation, is another part which is more and more becoming important in these agreements. Uh, and it's unfortunate. Oh, I'm sorry, Sal. Well, let me just say, since I'm on the panel. <laughs> yes. Oh. If I can remember what I was saying. Okay, go ahead, Sal. Well, I wanted to respond to what you said, Susan, and to what uh, uh, Dick said about making his choices. Um, if we had a social system, or a system where we have free education and free uh, health care, um, and housing that was somehow, you know, controlled so that the prices weren't you know, fantastic people again. Uh, there wouldn't be those kind of choices. Um, uh, it would be a totally different system. Uh, it wouldn't be a capitalist system, which definitely we have to get rid of. Um, so that's what I want to say. Okay. On that note, unless somebody else had a comment, we can go ahead and close. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much.